started. So let's just jump into it. Uh, first of all, um, I asked Rich to create two little polls uh, that uh, we have on, on our uh, hop-in page here. So I would be really happy if you folks could sort of like just select the languages, the programming languages, or if you've used uh, PLC4X before, that would be just some really cool feedback. Um, so first of all, thanks for that. Um, so let's get started. Um, we're, this session is going to be a bit different than the other ones because I'm not talking about any special features of PLC4X as I usually do, but I'm going to uh, show you what amazing stuff we've been doing behind the scenes to um, build PLC4X. Um, first of all, who am I? Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Dutz. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer for a company called Matt. Um, and uh, I always have been a, a real open source enthusiast. So I, I think my first email to an Apache list was in 1999 in the Apache Cocoon project. Uh, well, and since then I've grown a bit on the uh, ASF. Uh, I'm, I'm a committer in uh, really a lot of uh, projects. Uh, I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation. And uh, what honors me most is uh, I'm currently serving as a vice president of the Apache PLC4X project. Um, if you want to uh, follow me, what, what I'm up to, um, just follow me on Twitter. The LinkedIn, uh, that's where I usually post a little bit more details on stuff and uh, a bit less funny stuff. Um, but the cool thing is, um, even if I work on open source most of my free time, I'm also uh, really happy that I can actually contribute really a lot uh, during my, my day job. So what are we going to be talking about today? Um, well, it's all about polyglot plc for x um, I want to tell you why and what challenges we have with that. I'm going to uh, dig into uh, our solution to the problem. Uh, I, I won't be spoiling what it is uh, right now. Uh, and then I'm going to be showing you uh, some API examples. Um, how, how does PLC for X look on different uh, languages? Uh, I'm going to show you uh, how we ensure the quality of our drivers and uh, give you a little outlook on what's uh, to come in the near future. So. It's all about different languages. While uh, on Earth, we're, we're quite used to it. Uh, there are uh, a lot of languages out there. Uh, if you speak English, uh, well, you can uh, reach quite a lot. But if, when it comes to uh, programming languages, there are a lot of barriers. So supporting multiple uh, programming languages uh, really is uh, something uh, that's worth uh, investing a bit of uh, time into. Um, and supporting multiple languages was always uh, my biggest plan when I started this project. Um, when when uh, we, I, I was searching for a name uh, even before we, we entered the incubator. And uh, from the start, I didn't want to call it PLC4J, but I wanted to call it PLC4X um, because the X stands for multiple languages. Because uh, let's face it, um, writing PLC driver code uh, it's not the most difficult thing you can do. Uh, it's sort of like you just write some bits, you write some bytes in its given order, and you parse them again. Um, but the difficult thing is understanding the protocols. Um, so um, as soon as a protocol is understood, there's actually no real reason why we shouldn't just be shipping um, drivers from multiple languages. Uh, now, instantly, uh, a lot of people said, oh, yeah, come on, uh, try uh, cross-compiling it um, uh, or, or write a wrapper for it. So uh, if I just think of uh, having a C++ library that sort of internally links to some Java virtual machine that's sort of wrapped in some glue code, that's just sort of insane and I'm I'm not a big fan of doing this. Um, it's the, the result is just insanely big, needs a lot of memory um, and especially there's a really really strange uh, feeling to the API. I mean if I just take a Java library and I cross compile that to something that you can run and see, I think you can imagine that this library will not feel really native. Um, and um, also Different languages sort of have different sweet spots in which uh, where you can use them. Uh, for example, uh, next slide, I did a little analysis of, or 
of an, an analysis. I just checked how big uh, the drivers were that we were building. And um, sometimes size does matter. Um, this is an example. Um, I created a, a little application using the Modbus driver that reads values from a PLC. Um, I should mention the C version that even works on non-POSIX systems. So you can use that on, um, I built those drivers intentionally for these STM32 super low powered uh, embedded systems. Um, so you can use that driver with uh, 134 kilobytes. Uh, you can stick that on some really, really small hardware. Um, if you've got some big fat servers, well, memory doesn't really matter. Uh, so uh, nothing's keeping you from just uh, sticking uh, with Java, and uh, that's where you've got all the, the features, all the bells and whistles. And let's say C is sort of the stripped down version. There's uh, not too much optimization happening in the background. Uh, we wanted to keep the drivers small. And Go, uh, sort of that came uh, to the project um, end of last year when I joined Matt. Um, that's sort of the, the, the compromise between size and features. Uh, it's sort of, well, it's not really a compromise. So we're trying to provide all the features we have in Go, uh, but with a fraction of the size. Um, yeah, so it really depends on what your use case is. If you want to run it on super low power devices, well, uh, I think Java is out of the question. Pro Go probably is also out of the question. So C is probably your friend. Uh, if you're working with some sort of raspberry sized uh, edge gateways, uh, well, I would say even if Java is able to run on it, uh, maybe it's not the best thing you could do. So I, I would strongly suggest to stick with Go. Um, Java definitely has the best integration modules uh, because, uh, let's face it, uh, I bet uh, sort of 90% of uh, the open source uh, projects you've uh, been presented here at ApacheCon, well, they will probably play nicely with, uh, with Java. So which challenges do we have? Well, we wanted to provide multiple drivers for multiple um, protocols but also want to support that on yet another uh, number of uh, programming languages. Well, you can do the math that requires you to write n uh, times m drivers. Uh, it's really, really difficult to keep all these versions aligned. And uh, it's really, really difficult um, to sort of test all of this. So uh, from the start, we, we never started thinking that we would be handwriting all of these drivers. So uh, when when I started writing the first driver in PLC4X, I knew that every line of code I was writing was going to be for the trash bin, because I knew I was writing handwriting drivers for which then I will be implementing uh, some code generation, and then I'll just be deleting everything that I wrote. Uh, and I have to admit, that was one of the most satisfying commits that I uh, was able to do, just sort of delete all of my old code uh, and replace it with new ones. And that's exactly what happened uh, between version 0.6 and 0.7. So the versions uh, starting with 0.7, they work exclusively with uh, fully generated drivers. Um, another thing is uh, every now and then somebody finds a bug and reports a bug, or maybe we reversed and engineered a protocol differently uh, and uh, found out, oh, we did a mistake there. So that would mean uh, fixing one of these bugs would sort of require people to fix bugs in all of the M languages that we support. Um, possibly even uh, work with uh, M different programming environments. Uh, I mean, uh, IntelliJ is a great text editor, but if you want to write C code, well, IntelliJ is probably not the best tool you can use for that. Um, also, different languages use different API patterns. Yeah, while, while Java, uh, we use a lot of uh, futures. Um, in Go, you usually use channels. Uh, in C, well, in C is sort of like uh, iterate a lot. Um, and uh, so that's quite a challenge. And just to give you a little picture of uh, the current state of the project, uh, which would mean uh, that all of these boxes would need coloring. 
at the top, you can see the protocols we currently support. Uh, I think I didn't even add the Profinet because I didn't want, uh, that's the one I'm currently working on. Um, but um, the programming languages that we already really support uh, is Java, C, and Go. Uh, we already have a code generation for C Sharp. Uh, we have an API for C++. Um, the Python uh, Python initiative will probably uh, be seeded uh, in a few months or so. Um, yeah, and we're even thinking of uh, removing uh, the C++ part and replacing that with Rust. But you can see each of these white boxes would need implementing, and that's just sort of out of the question. So what do we do? Our solution was um, that well, we wanted some form of specification uh, where uh, where we can uh, define how a protocol looks like in a machine readable form. Um, we then have so-called protocol mo modules. So uh, if I want to implement a Profinet driver, well, I write a Profinet protocol module that has this protocol description inside. Uh, we then have a language template for each supported programming language. So uh, if I want to generate a Go Profinet driver, well, then I take the, uh, the Profinet protocol module and the Go language template and stick that into our Maven plugin. And that just produces Go code that you can just compile and start using. Um, when it came to uh, the specification, uh, I mean, if you have a look in the internet, there are loads and loads and loads of ways to actually specify a protocol. But I had a look, look, um, I had a look at most of them, uh, uh, even a lot of programs for uh, code generation, uh, sort of uh, thrift, uh, gRPC, and stuff like that. Um, but none of them really worked. A lot of them were missing uh, important parts. Um, I mean, uh, especially uh, like uh, Thrift uh, and uh, gRPC, these frameworks, um, they generate code and it's perfect for bringing something from A to B and uh, A and B is identical in the end, but it doesn't give you control over what goes over the wire. And that's the problem because we don't have A, sort of A is given and we need something that the transport format uh, serializes and parses uh, into uh, an object model. And that was uh, why we then uh, invented our own format and we called that mspec. Um, because uh, it's not only about serializing and parsing and, and generating the code, um, we also need to test the stuff that we're doing. Um, and the same problem uh, applies for uh, for tests as uh, for the code generation uh, of the of the driver code itself, because um, you don't want to hand implement all of these tests that you need uh, in all of these languages. Mm, so we built our own unit test framework um, because drivers are complex. We also added uh, our own integration test framework. And with this, uh, we're really able to generate most of the annoying parts of uh, driver code generate, uh, dr driver uh, writing. Um, so let me give you a little example. Um, Lukas already mentioned in his last talk uh, Modbus uh, TCP and uh, the serial variant. Uh, so here I have uh, an example of such an M spec um, description. So let me. This is the one with the mouse. Uh, so what we have here, we have uh, so-called types. That's a simple type. Um, uh, this is uh, the TCP variant. Um, and this is the serial variant. The cool thing, what you can see, is both reference uh, a Modbus PDU. And uh, that comes here. But just stepping uh, one step back. Um, so how does a Modbus TCP packet look like? Well, first of all, there comes a, a simple 16-bit uh, unsigned integer. We just call that transaction identifier. 
Okay, that's that's not very very sophisticated. But then, then comes a constant value that's a 16-bit unsigned integer, which we call protocol identifier, and that's expected to be zero. So if a packet comes in and that's not zero, well, then we get an uh, an exception uh, or an error depending on the programming language. Then there are some other parts that, um, like the length here, um, that's that's a part that. Uh, is required on the wire, but it wouldn't make sense to sort of hand calculate this value and output it here. It also doesn't make sense to store this value in the in the model because it's sort of implicitly defined by the model itself. And so that's why we called it an implicit. Uh, so we have here a 16-bit uh, unsigned integer. Um, and when we parse a packet, it just parses it as length. Um, but when we serialize the packet, uh, we uh, get its length by taking the PDU uh, element and getting its length in bytes and adding one to it. And by this, we now don't have to um, take care of uh, initializing uh, and setting this value and don't even have to specify, uh, uh, sort of uh, store it. Um, now, these were simple types. And we also have complex types. And complex types are uh, sort of when you start referencing other, uh, in Java speak, though, those would be other Java classes that you're referencing. So in this case, we have a Modbus uh, PDU type uh, object, which we call PDU. Um, and that's described down here. Uh, you can see here, we can also pass along um, uh, arguments. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're just uh, parsing this uh, from the constructor, passing it over. Uh, this is needed because uh, Modbus doesn't have uh, the, the notion of uh, a request or a response field. So if you get a packet that has the same number as a, a, a packet that, that you sent away uh, just a, a, a few seconds ago, well, that's then the response. So we have to pass that along. So in this case, we have a discriminated type. And this is uh, a good example because uh, in these binary protocols, you usually have a byte or some, some data values that describe what the rest of the packet will actually be. So in this case, there is no real Modbus PDU. But depending on the error flag and the function flag, um, depending on this, uh, it will identify an, uh, a concrete um, Modbus packet, for example. Well, if it's just, if the error flag is set, well, then it's a Modbus PDU error packet. It doesn't really matter what the what the function uh, flag is uh, or, or what the response is. But if, if the error was false, um, the, the, the function flag was two, uh, and uh, it's not a response, well, then it's a, a Modbus PDU read discrete inputs request. If uh, it's a response, well, then it's the corresponding response. And you can see the data structure is different between the two. And that's why it's important uh, for this to uh, pass it along. So uh, I won't be going, uh, yeah, I already shortened this. But I hope it gives you a little um, example on how, uh, how we can uh, really easily uh, define um, how a protocol looks. And the good thing is this format is easily readable by humans. So I could sort of like just print that in, in the documentation. And I think most people will sort of understand uh, what it does. But we can also uh, interpret um, by our code generation framework and really generate everything that is needed to read and write packets in uh, this uh, format that we just specified. Get control over here. So the current state um, is that, well, PLC for J, uh, that's our first class citizen. That was the first, um, that, uh, first system that we worked on with that. Uh, starting uh, the second quarter of last year, uh, I uh, invested about half a year of full-time work on uh, implementing PLC for C. Um, and starting uh, October uh, last year, uh, I uh, started working on PLC for Go. And there are now more and more people uh, joining in on that. Uh, sort of as a little 
coding exercise uh, at, at night, sort of. Uh, I uh, implemented a code generation for PLC for net. That's I think it's still uh, stuck in uh, one of my branches. Um, PLC for C++ would actually be not that difficult to do. Um, but we're more thinking of dropping that and replacing that with uh, Rust. Uh, we just don't, it's just m sort of gaining more and more traction. And I think uh, there are not much benefits uh, to sort of like hand write drivers in uh, C++. I saw with PLC for C how much you have to take care of yourself. And uh, that's just not a lot of fun. Uh, the community is really eager to uh, continue and uh, start working on a PLC for, for Python. So um, I promise I want to show you little examples on how such an API uh, in PLC for X looks like uh, in different languages. So I selected uh, uh, an application that uses the Modbus uh, to read one item and to output the result on the console. And so I'm just taking this example and showing you how the code looks uh, in different languages. Well, this is probably the, the version that you've uh, seen uh, in multiple uh, talks before. Uh, so what happens here is uh, at first, and that's the same with all drivers. So we try to sort of keep the things that you need to do um, on a logically uh, pretty similar um, level. So what you generally do is you ask a driver manager to give you a connection. And you specify what you want to connect to by providing uh, a connection string. So this is very similar to what you know from uh, JDBC. Um, um, so as soon as you've got a connection, uh, well, you ask uh, the connection to uh, provide um, uh, a read request builder. So we're using uh, this builder pattern uh, all over the place. Uh, so in this case, we're using the builder to uh, create a request uh, with one item. I said, uh, I'm just naming it field. And uh, this is sort of uh, an address string in, in Modbus. Uh, we changed the, the syntax of that uh, to be more in line with, uh, with the default uh, used uh, in, in Modbus. Um, but uh, this also still works. Um, so what we do here is we create a PLC read request to read this one field, uh, a real value, uh, and store that in, uh, a, with the name field. Now, as I said, in um, Java, we do a, a lot of things uh, with futures. So what happens here is we then execute that read request. And the cool thing with this pattern is we can actually execute this request multiple times. There are some protocols where this creating of a read request, for example, uh, is not for free. Sometimes you have to sort of prepare the PLC uh, to provide you in with some information. So. Um, being able to sort of re-execute um, a request is actually uh, quite a good thing. So here we just register um, a handler uh, that just iterates over all field names that were in the read response. Uh, we check if the, the response code was OK. If it's OK, we output it on the screen. Uh, well, and if it didn't go well, uh, we output an error message. I think. Um, if there are any questions uh, regarding any, any of these APIs, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, I'll, I'll be hanging around in uh, either the IoT boff or the, the whiskey boff after this. Uh, so feel free to approach me uh, if you've got questions. In Go, it looks very similar. But there's one thing that we should mention, because uh, while in Java, we use uh, the service lookup uh, mechanism to sort of that dynamically find all the drivers that are in the class path. With Go, this would have been not that ideal because Go compiles in everything that is needed. So if we would uh, start PLC for Go with all drivers enabled, you would probably get a pretty fat uh, application. And that's why we uh, decided to, uh, to go this path. So you also get yourself a driver manager, and then you tell that one which which driver do you actually want to use? 
Um, and uh, you can also register transports. So if you want to use Modbus with a serial uh, transport, you can sort of just say drivers register transport and tell it uh, to uh, register the serial transport. Uh, but starting then, uh, it, it, it's pretty similar. You, you have the driver manager. You ask him to get a connection. You pass in the same connection string. But in this case, you get back a pipe uh, or, or a channel. Uh, so what we do here is now we just, it, this is a blocking read. It's sort of not the best style to do things. But for the sake of simplicity of this uh, example, uh, here we're reading one element out of this uh, pipe. Uh, out of this channel, um, checking if everything was OK. Uh, if everything was OK, uh, well, we, we'll just fetch that connection object. Um, in Java, we have this try with, uh, with a resources uh, catch block that automatically closes the connection as soon as it leaves. In uh, Go, we do this with uh, defer. So. Uh, in case, uh, as soon as the application terminates, uh, well, we make sure that uh, the connection is closed. Here, same thing happens. Uh, we get a read request builder. We add uh, a query to that. Uh, we uh, then uh, build a read request. That happens instantly. Uh, if everything went OK, we execute the read request. Um, and as with the connection, we get a channel back, a read request channel. Uh, we do a blocking wait in this case. Uh, we get a read request result. Check if that was uh, if if we got any errors. If we got errors, well, we output them. If we didn't get uh, any errors, well, we'll check uh, if reading that field was okay. Uh, if it was okay, we'll output it and just terminate here. If something went wrong, well, we'll tell uh, the user what went wrong. So I'd say the Go example, you can see that, in general, it's very similar. But uh, the details uh, of how things are done are much more in line with the way things are done in Go. Now we come to C. This, is, uh, the, 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 th this was definitely the most challenging thing, because you don't have anything like objects and stuff like that. So what we have here is, first of all, we need to create a, a PLC for C system. So that just in, initializes uh, the core data structures in which we construct our driver manager. So what we do now is we create a driver for Modbus. We add that to the system. By this, uh, we make it available to the driver manager. Um, we also create a TCP transport. Uh, we also add that to the system. So now we've got a, a PLC for a system that's pre-prepared, and we have to sort of initialize it. Uh, now we've got a running um, driver manager to sort of like in, in Java, in the Java world, this would have been uh, the time where we have the, the working driver manager. So here we now ask the, the PLC for a system that we pass in uh, to please connect to this uh, address and provide us uh, with the connection uh, as a response. So if everything went OK, uh, we'll just uh, now, now comes the, the, the tricky part, because uh, we don't have these, these objects. And uh, I wanted it to run on systems that might not be POSIX uh, compatible with uh, they, they, they don't even have to have multiple threads. So it should work in a single threaded application. Um, so that's why we decided to stick uh, with a, a state machine. So that's what happens here. We were initializing the state of the state machine. We're uh, just looping in there. Um, now, this is the part that might seem pretty insignificant, but that's actually where all the work is done. So what happens here is as soon as the 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 the, the, program, the thread comes by, uh, it goes into there. Uh, and that's where it can see what there is currently uh, to do. Uh, so it, it is, do I have to send something? Do Is some anybody expecting to read something? Uh, what, does anything have to be initialized? So it's sort of where the thread goes in, uh, does some work, and then just comes back. 
And depending on the state, well, if we're currently connecting, uh, well, we're just checking if uh, this connection is marked as connected. Um, if it's not connected, well, it will just go out, come back here, do the loop thing again, and maybe one at some time uh, the connection uh, request a response was received. So in that case, uh, well, get connected will be true, and well, then we'll just go to connected. And uh, you see, it's quite a bit more complicated, but I think um, if you're living in the embedded world, I think you're used to pain, uh, and uh, I guess you really uh, learn to cherish that you're not bound to sort of stick with some fat libraries that you have to use because PLC for X works without any external third party libraries. So um, now we're connected. So now what we do is we want to prepare a read request. So in this case, we don't create a builder, but we create an uninitialized read request and we just add items to that. So you can see here, it's the same uh, address string. We also call it field. Um, as soon as it's uh, done, uh, then we say execute. And what happens now is that another state machine is created. Uh, sort of we create little tokens uh, with uh, state machines in them. And that is added to the system queue. And that's exactly the queue that is uh, handled uh, at the beginning of this uh, loop. So this is what then is uh, managed by this. Uh, so we sent uh, off the request. So now we have to wait till the response. So that's what happens here. Uh, check if it's uh, finished successfully. As soon as it's finished successfully, we go over to response received. If there was an error, well, we go, uh, we just terminate and say, well, it failed. Uh, and if it's just not finished yet, well, we just be back in a few milliseconds. Assuming we read uh, successfully, well, then we get the response. Um, we iterate over uh, the elements uh, of uh, the, over the fields uh, and just output them here. At the end, of course, in C, nobody cleans up for you. You have to do all of that yourself. Um, and in the end, make sure that you're sort of disconnecting and as soon as the connections are done, we'll do the cleaning up of shut down the system gracefully, destroy the system gracefully, and terminate the program. As a little teaser, um, so haven't finished that yet, was this um, a pull request that came in from a new community member. Uh, this is how uh, the same API could look like uh, in C-sharp. Um, seen some slightly different patterns, but I think everybody who understood the previous um, examples will uh, be fine with this one. I mentioned that testing all of this uh, is a challenge and uh, we solved this uh, by using XML. Uh, so we define our test cases in XML. Um, and uh, the unit test framework is solely concentrating on uh, testing our serializers and parsers. Um, and the procedure is always the same. Uh, the test case consists of a, of a binary string. Uh, it takes that and passes it to the parser. Um, and that outputs an object structure. Uh, we then serialize that to an XML form, sort of like in Java, usually you would say you have this Java object model and you use Jackson to create some XML out of that. Well, we're not using Jackson, uh, we're using our own stuff, um, but um, in general, that's what happens. We produce XML and we compare that XML with the expected result of the test case. And only if that worked fine, uh, then we'll just take the object that was uh, parsed uh, just uh, a few milliseconds ago, and then we pass that to the serializers and serialize that again. That will produce a, a byte array of data uh, as an output, and we just compare that with the original input. So we can ensure that both the serializers and the parsers actually produce what we expect it to. But that's only uh, sort of a small fragment of uh, the work that we have to do. Uh, so um, ah, here I have a little example of how such a test case looks like. 
So we just give it a name because that just helps uh, if something goes wrong. Here you can see the, the binary input. Uh, two digits are always uh, interpreted as one byte. Uh, this should be a Modbus TCP ADU. So we're using the Modbus TCP ADU parser to parse that. And it should produce this data structure. So you can see the Modbus TCP ADU with a transaction identifier of zero. We have a protocol identifier of zero. The length should be six. Uh, the unit identifier should be 255. Uh, the PDU should be a Modbus uh, PDU. Um, and this is the, the abstract type. Uh, you remember the, the discriminators, the, the error flag and the function flag, they were part of the base type. Uh, and this is then the, the discriminated concrete um, type. So uh, it should have a starting address of uh, 2,258 uh, and a quantity of two. So you see it parses it serializes what it parsed to XML, compares that with this, then serializes it and compares it if it matches the original one. And yeah. But as I mentioned, serialize and parsers are only a small part of the, the, uh, the challenge. So we also built a unit test framework. And that doesn't test the parsers and serializers. It tests the drivers. So it takes the full driver and uh, simulates uh, that driver being used. So what, what happens here is we replace the transport, which is usually serial or TCP or, or UDP, or as Lucas uh, used it, uh, the, the, the can open uh, protocol or transport, and we replace that with a test transport. We then can define test setup steps because drivers, if, if you want to do a read operation, well, you sometimes need to connect first. So we have these... Uh, notions of uh, setup steps that are executed. Um, then each test case uh, consists of um, PLC for X API requests being fired against the driver. We intercept the output the driver produces. We inject responses. So we inject um, what we expect the PLC to answer to that question. And in the end, we get responses from the API and we just compare if that matches what we're expecting to get. So here we have a little example. Um, luckily, uh, this is also, uh, let me have a look. Yeah, we're still in Modbus world. Uh, so Modbus has no connection. So in this case, we don't even need any setup steps. But what you can see here is uh, this test case single element read request that consists of multiple steps. The first is an API request. So an, an application would use the plc for x API to uh, issue a request, and it would pass in a, a, a field with the name Hoots uh, and uh, with this address. So the Modbus driver would now produce some binary output that it would send over the wire. If we parse that again, this would uh, be what we expect it to send. Uh, so we would be expecting a Modbus TCP ADU with all of these values set. Uh, if that matches, well, then we fire in this. Uh, so we, we take this, uh, this object and we serialize it into its binary form and pass that into the driver. And assuming all goes well, in this case, we would then uh, expect the driver to... Uh, execute an API response and uh, pass along uh, this value of uh, zero. Nah, where is it? Ah, uh, uh, this, this, this is just the address. Um, we would be expecting uh, to get pi, the value of uh, the real value of pi um, as a response. And so if all of this worked, then the test case is considered green. And the cool thing is this works in Java. This works in Go. So if we spot a pro problem in, in Java, for example, and we adjust the test case to test that, uh, we can also immediately spot if things work in Go. And if they don't work in Go, well, we can fix them instantly. So what are our plans uh, in the future? Um, it might sound as if we're sort of producing everything, um, but that's sort of like we're producing the biggest part of the drivers. 
but what we're still missing is sort of the logic part. But especially if you've been implementing drivers for the last four or five years, as I have been, uh, you certainly notice uh, certain patterns. So we did notice that in general, you always have sort of this, this thing of a request response. So you produce a data structure and you fire that away, and then you prepare sort of something that expects an, uh, something to come back. And writing these data structures, that can be really, really big. Uh, for example, the connection packet for Profinet, I think that was five screen high uh, data structure that I had to initialize. Uh, so the thing is, these data structures have to be initialized the same way on all platforms. The, the only thing that differs is the way they are initialized. So what we want to do next is we want to specify these request response interactions. And as soon as that's done, uh, well, the last missing piece is actually just the state machine that says, in this case, do this interaction of a request response, then go over into the next state. In this state, do this. So um, I already tried that. Uh, I think before in PLC for X uh, 0.6, I had a demo of a, a driver that used the Apache Daffodil project uh, together with the Apache Commons SC XML2 engine to produce a working S7 driver solely using um, two XML files. So it is possible. Uh, it's going to be a challenge, but it's definitely going to be worth it. Uh, and it's definitely a lot of work. So um, we really need your help. and. Help is always highly appreciated. Uh, how can this help look like? Well, if, if you want to, well, of course, we, we won't keep you from coding. Um, but one of the best things you can do is actually test our stuff. So if you've got some machinery and you want to try it out, well, just trying out plc for x and reporting any problems that you might be having, that's what brings the project forward. Provide pre feedback. Provide insights. Maybe we thought something works in a certain way and we were simply wrong. Uh, providing us such information that is actually, that's just, we, we can't pay that. It's, it's just uh, the, the best thing you could do. Um, promote plc for uh, If you like what you've heard uh, here uh, or in previous uh, sessions, just talk about it. As soon as somebody asks, oh, how can I get this data? Um, uh, tell them about plc for -X. Get into contact with us. We, we're a very friendly bunch. Our mailing list is really cool. Um, and uh, if you follow, want to follow uh, what what we're up to and uh, listen to his tweets, uh, Toddy says hi. Uh, follow him on Twitter. He's always happy. Mm. Yeah, so thanks for listening. And uh, as I'm the last one of this track, I think uh, I can do Q&A as long as I want. And I can see there are two questions. Um, can you define plug uh, define a plug-in driver custom protocol to make available? Yes. Um, so uh, in PLC for J, for example, if you, uh, I, I hope I'm getting your question right. Uh, so you're saying that assuming you have your own protocol uh, at your company that maybe just your company uses or you don't want to share. You can use mspec to produce uh, drivers uh, that uh, you can then also run in plc for x uh, and you get the benefit of getting all the, the integration modules that we already have. Um, was that, uh, did that answer your question, uh, Paolo? Uh, Let me just read, just as an example scenario, even if not really in the protocol, vast majority of Modbus PLCs and sensors um, provide ins floats on 30. Yeah, I think we already do that in Modbus. Uh, I mean, Modbus only knows uh, coils, uh, which are Boolean values, or registers, which are short values. It doesn't even specify if they're signed, unsigned, or whatever. It's just two bytes. And uh, as you um, saw, uh, we were using uh, real, uh, the, the type real. So what that does in the background, it automatically just fetches two uh, subsequent uh, registers and interprets that as a real value. 
Ah, so that was the question. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, big engine, little engine. Well, that's sort of like, yeah, we, we've uh, we've been sort of avoiding that uh, uh, that thought for for quite some time. We know there are PLCs out there that tend to send their data in a big engine or little engine format. But uh, I think uh, we have, haven't have yet encountered anyone who reported any problems with little endian uh, devices. But uh, yes, uh, if that happens, well, we will uh, definitely uh, get working on that. Problem is, it's really hard to uh, sort of test this sort of stuff if you don't have any devices that actually supports that. So any other questions? I think isn't big engine the easy one? Little engine was always the one that annoys me. Uh, but uh, if you know any any hardware that uh, sort of uses an endianness that we don't support, um, please uh, tell us about it. If it's cheap hardware, we might even just get it. Um, yeah, cool. So, any other questions? Well, I can at least see that most people still in the chat uh, are actually part of the project. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I would be really happy if uh, I, I could see some interest in this uh, and maybe the one or the other will show up in one of our mailing lists uh, or in our Slack. Uh, we're, we're happy for everyone. Okay. So guess uh, I'll guess it's a wrap, um, and uh, let's go over to the drinking part of this conference. So it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me, and uh, I really hope that uh, we'll be able to see each other soon uh, in real. Bye.